Okay, it is my great pleasure to introduce again uh, our next speaker, Professor Alberto Nandoni. Um, he is going to give us the second lecture on thermoplasmonics. So, welcome. Um, thank you. So, yeah. Thank you and uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, so, today I'm going to give last lecture of the school. Yeah. So, uh, I'll try to be uh, short and uh, uh, give my perspective from a material scientist uh, uh, on how we can use the localization of heat produced by uh, restaurant nanostructure. Uh, and so, uh, I can change it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, So, uh, as we saw uh, yesterday, uh, the thermoplasmonic uh, field basically covers the dissipation of surface plasma. So, yesterday we saw the, uh, we how we can use the hot electrons, uh, which comes from the phasing of surface plasma, to do very different things. While today uh, uh, I will show you the um, dissipation of the surface plasma into heat and uh, how we can use the resonant nanostructures to really use this localized heating, which is very convenient. Uh, form of heating in comparison to bulk heating uh, of uh, uh, bulk devices, of course, because we can use much less energy, but also because uh, because we can control uh, processes at the nanoscale. So uh, this is uh, again uh, uh, the thermal evolution, uh, the time evolution of the surface plasma excitation. Uh, so after the uh, excitation of the plasmas, we have the um, the phasing of the plasma, and, and then in time of 100 picoseconds to nanoseconds, uh, all the uh, energy which is stored in the uh, resonant excitations is uh, dissipated into the lattice of materials. And so we can create really intense uh, uh, temperature uh, at the uh, nanoscale. <coughs> and uh, so the, uh, where it's coming from, all this heat, basically this heat is uh, simply uh, coming from Joule effect, so from the um, <coughs> from the dissipation of the energy due to the electron scattering uh, into the, the surface density wave oscillations, and uh, therefore the heat source density can really be easily uh, obtained considering the um, the Joule effect. So uh, knowing the current uh, uh, coming from the surface plasma excitation and the electric field which is produced in the plasma, and okay, this is not working. And therefore, uh, what we end up at the end is that the heat source uh, power density uh, is depends, uh, of course, on the frequency of excitations, uh, on the imaginary part of the, the electric uh, permittivity, and also to the uh, uh, on the uh, square of the electric field. So this is uh, interesting uh, formula because uh, we can see that basically to have really uh, high energy. Uh, and a high gradient of temperature localized at the nanoscale, uh, we would need to have uh, really strong electric fields confined uh, on the surface of our materials, but also we should have also very high optical losses. And so this is tricky because it's, it's a, a bit uh, uh, going, uh, uh, they are going <laughs> a bit uh, against each other. Indeed, if you want a high electric field, usually you have to have a high quality resonator, so you have to uh, have a metal which has high, um, high negative um, epsilon prime, so the real part of the uh, permittivity, uh, and otherwise you have to have low, low uh, optical losses. Uh, so therefore, uh, to have really a nice material for thermoplasmonics, you should have uh, a, nice, um, a nice balance between the electric field that you can generate and the losses coming from the uh, uh, epsilon double prime of the materials. Uh, of course, another uh, important requirement is the stability of the uh, plasmonic material that you have to use. And indeed, uh, depending on the temperature that you want to generate locally, uh, you can select your material. So if you want to, uh, of course, uh, generate the temperature in the, rate, uh, in the range between room temperature and 100 degree, you can use uh, normal, no normal, normal metal. Otherwise, if you want to go higher to the 
and you will see some application of this if you want to go higher into the high temperature or extreme temperature re regime so hundreds of centigrade uh, degrees centigrade or even thousands so you have to of course use different materials uh, such as for example uh, refractory um, metal nitrides or refractory metals uh, for instance so now this is what's just a brief introduction about what is behind so basically when once you calculate this from your nanostructures, uh, then uh, you can evaluate how the heat uh, basically um, uh, <coughs> stay or is uh, diffused in your system. So you have to uh, consider all the type uh, uh, all, the, all the different types of uh, heat um, channel uh, dispersion into the system, uh, like uh, like radiation or conduction, or convection, so on and so forth. And of course, uh, you have to consider. Uh, if you are working with a single wavelength, so you want to excite just with the laser, for example, your structure, or if you want to use uh, this local heating uh, using uh, broadband sources, so uh, um, solar uh, radiation. In this case, you have to compute, for example, uh, the heating uh, at each wavelength, and then sum up all the uh, all the contribution to have really uh, the total amount of heat that you generate into the system. Okay, now uh, I start to talk about application of the um, of the use of the uh, nano, um, of uh, uh, plasmonic nanostructure, and uh, this is uh, again one uh, one slide that I use in my lecture, and I find very interesting uh, that uh, uh, indeed we use 52% of, of all, all of the energy that we use to produce heating and cooling. Uh, and also, uh, the 70% uh, of the total emission of carbon dioxide comes from uh, the supply of heat for our society. So it's really important to develop some solar thermal technology uh, for uh, producing electricity or other purpose. And I would say that at the moment, the, um, the, um, the general scenario is that uh, the most diffuse solar thermal technology are, for example, solar panels that can be a solar thermal plant that can be used for uh, heat the water uh, in our uh, houses uh, or um, solar thermal uh, imp um, towers uh, to produce uh, uh, for example electricity uh, and we can see here some uh, solar thermal uh, parts which uh, are uh, developing around the world. I, I think also in uh, South America there is one uh, in, in Chile that has been opened in 2014. And uh, so we can use this solar, uh, solar thermal concentration of energy um, to do really many different things and to, uh, to drive many different processes, uh, chemical industry, heating and cooling, uh, and steam generation, so to produce again electricity, for example. And uh, these are uh, what I'm going to be talking about today and give you really uh, uh, the general overview of the different application that, uh, that we can um, study with by using a resonant structure and uh, uh, what is the gain of using a resonant structure, for example, in uh, in uh, um, photothermal therapy uh, or in uh, plasma uh, or in synthesis of nanostructures uh, in uh, in uh, energetic materials, so ex explosive or propellants, and in uh, solar technology like solar thermal photo photo photovoltaics, for example. There, there are, of course, uh, other many other applications that have been proposed. For example, uh, plasma-induced particle trapping, which is uh, different than the, the trapping uh, which was uh, outlined by the uh, plenary talk of science. In this case, uh, uh, resonant structure are used, for example, in liquids to create gradient of uh, temperature and create really uh, mm, create the possibility to, uh, to to trap between, for example, two different. Uh, nano antennas and other particles, and bring, for example, for several micrometers to uh, to, uh, to to trap really the particles and block the particle between the structures. And there is many different um, um, variation of the team on this team. Another interesting um, application that I, I'm not going to talk about, but it's just to say, uh, and uh, I forgot to <laughs> say to 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 outline the in this lecture is the heating. So we can use also. Um, resonant nano structure to produce some material which are able to actually heat uh, to, uh, to cool down the surface of your uh, house or your solar cell. In this case, uh, <coughs> it's also very interesting, and I can provide reference on this if you are interested uh, later after the lecture. 
so the, the first historical uh, application of uh, thermoplasmics was proposed at the end of the 90s, it was uh, the phototherma therapy. Uh, so in this case, we have resonant nano structure uh, that uh, are illuminated by uh, a monochromatic light and by uh, producing a change in the lo local temperature, basically they are able to, uh, to, um, to uh, uh, let's say, denaturate bio biological tissue or uh, tumoral tissues, for example. So the, um, let's say, the only requirement from uh, the photonic point of view is that you have to have a nanostructure with absorbing the so-called um, transparent, transparent, uh, bio biological transparency windows, so around 1,000 nanometer. And that's why uh, the most uh, famous uh, nanostructure is this uh, nano shell produced by the Alice group. Because uh, if you get the uh, gold particles, the, usually the, this will res would resonate around uh, 500 nanometer or 530 nanometer. Otherwise, if you get this core shell structure, you can really shift uh, towards the uh, the uh, red <coughs> in, um, wavelength range, the uh, absorption of the particles. So you can play with this. Um, a phototermality. Basically, what you do is just injecting these uh, particles into the uh, into the body and through uh, a, a recognition system based on uh, receptors. Basically, you can target your uh, your particles in a specific region where the tumoral tissue are expressed, mm -hmm. and therefore you can heat up, as you can see here, for example, uh, the locally the nanostructure, the uh, your mice, or in this case. Of course, the final uh, user would be us, mm -hmm. uh, and and so you can really um, uh, let's say treat your tumor, and then the latest development, for example, for these technologies that they are already under medical trials, so uh, they will probably become maybe they will become so some something which would be in the market. <coughs> so another uh, application that I found very much interesting as a material scientist is uh, the possibility to create. Uh, this very high local temperature, the nanoscale, and so you can uh, synthesize materials uh, with uh, plasmonic nanostructures. And this is a nice example, which was, of course, by Bronkers Group, one of the first reports on this, uh, of this kind. Uh, so basically, what they did it was they <coughs> deposited uh, an array of uh, resonant nanoparticles, in this case, was uh, gold, and uh, by shining with the laser uh, the light, so they create very intense uh, local heating. Uh, reaching temperature around 300, 400 degrees C at the surface uh, of the metal particles. And then uh, they, um, they put inside the reaction chamber uh, gas uh, chemical in the, for, in the gas form, and uh, they basically mimic uh, chemical buffer deposition method, which usually uh, you do uh, using thermal uh, <coughs> heating up all the system. And so as you can see, you can create a uh, very nice nanostructure. In this case, it was titanium oxide or uh, um, or let, uh, oxide uh, selectively on the surface of uh, other of the resonant structures. So this is very important, for example, for catalysis if you want to create core shell structure, uh, or uh, you want to uh, uh, selectively functionalize the, the specific platform to uh, to be used, for example, for uh, biodetection or or, or other uh, purpose. And uh, it's also interesting. This is again another example. They were also able to grow, it's possible to grow single nano wires uh, templated on the, uh, on the, uh, on the uh, metal particles. In this case, this process is really mimicking what's happening, for example, a normal vapor uh, to uh, solid process which are used to, to, to grow nano wires. So uh, you heat up uh, the single uh, plasmonic particles and you put inside your um, your uh, chemicals in the gas form, and so you can create single nanostructure in the precise position uh, that you want to have. And uh, through some calculation, for example, they also show that uh, you can use 10 to the fifth lower energy than conventional processes. So this is what is really interesting about this phenomenon and this uh, um, possibility of thermoplasmonic. So you can just use the, the power which is uh, needed to uh, to uh, for your laser, for your uh, for your light source, uh, to locally create uh, a, a specific chemical processes. Otherwise, with thermal uh, process, you have to eat up all the uh, all the your uh, uh, necessary setup to to grow the nanostructures. 
This is uh, similar, uh, the, in this case they use a similar approach, this is another application thought. So uh, always this uh, early approach they all use uh, metal nanoparticles deposited on glass for example, as is in this case, but uh, and in this group they also build um, uh, optophilic devices where uh, they uh, let pass through uh, a fluid flow uh, close to the surface of the gold particles. So, so when, when they shine the light, uh, they uh, observe the formation uh, of uh, uh, a bubble of gas close to the uh, surface uh, of the uh, resonant nanostructure. And uh, they, uh, what they did was uh, to uh, basically put inside methanol and water. Uh, and they analyzed uh, at the end of, the, uh, of the, their device, basically with a GC uh, or mass spectrometer, now, now to remember the products. And what they saw, uh, what that they were able to create basically carbon dioxide and hydrogen. So they were able to drive heterogeneous catalysis in situ, so the uh, photoreforming process. Of the met of the ethanol uh, by just shining the light. So uh, always, uh, usually, uh, this process really happens at high temperature, like 300, 400 degrees C. So this is really uh, something that was uh, the, the the real proof that uh, we could drive uh, heterogeneous catalytic process uh, by just using uh, uh, a light source and the metal nanoparticles. So this was very important and triggered a lot of interest in my field, for example. A similar, uh, um, let's say, application is uh, what now is very uh, hot topic in the uh, scientific uh, community is the generation of, of steam uh, by using uh, these uh, resonant nanostructures. And um, the, the community, are, uh, uh, in this case, so you have always the, your resonant an an antenna, you shine the light, and you, cre you create steam generation. So you would say, why steam is an interesting, but actually, uh, steam really is one of the uh, one of the uh, most important, uh, mm -hmm, let's say, uh, input of energy to create electrical energy, uh, and so it is really uh, something that uh, is um, important to develop for our society to obtain steam uh, in a more renewable way. And the fourth, so if you uh, if we take, for example, in consideration uh, the possibility of how we can uh, evaporate water or create steam in different system, we can see that uh, we can have a bulk heating, so we can put something which is hot at the bottom of our beaker or our uh, container uh, containing water, or you can put uh, nanoparticles uh, which goes uh, which are dispersed inside the liquid, and then we heat up everything, uh, or otherwise we can. Mm, we can uh, localize the heat at the interface between the, uh, the, the air and the liquid. In this case, uh, the heat transfer is much more uh, convenient than in the, arc in, in the other case. Um, so this technology is not only important for steam generation, but for example for desalin desalination. So uh, having the fresh water for those countries which has uh, the majority of the uh, territory which is desertic, for example, is very pro uh, is a real problem. So this uh, is something that uh, people are looking into this. And uh, so this is uh, some example of uh, uh, plasmonic nanomaterials, which has been developed uh, for solar evaporation. For example, as we can see uh, in uh, this case, uh, the um, the authors uh, use uh, a membrane uh, of uh, uh, alumina, which is inside this pattern with the uh, magnetic sputtering nanoparticles of gold. Uh, so uh, what they obtained, of course, there was a kind of a, a perfect absorber. So the nanoparticles, uh, in this case, as of course, uh, their uh, own single, um, if you take into consideration one single particle, of course, they will have a single uh, surface plasma resonance. But in this case, you have a collective oscillation of many different resonance because they can interact with each, between each other because they are very close at the nanoscale. And so what you obtain is a very broad uh, resonance, a plasmonic resonance, which can cover all the source spectrum, as you can see here. And uh, so you can really uh, obtain a perfect absorber, which, which absorbs very much. So of course, uh, the problem, uh, we can, you can obtain similar, uh, similar uh, material, also with the black materials, like carbon materials, you would say. Um, so, uh, of course, this can be done, but the, the problem and the advantages of, uh, the advantages of uh, plasmonic structure in general, or array of plasmonic structure, is that you can uh, tailor 
the uh, arrangement of your unit cell and how they can organize in the space. And therefore, you can achieve selective absorption or selective emissions. Uh, and this is very important because, of course, if you have uh, uh, materials which absorb uh, all over the spectrum, uh, um, this material most probably will have also lots of uh, losses uh, in uh, radiation. So uh, if you will start to heat up, this material will, will start to cool down by, um, uh, by radiation. And therefore, if you are able to tailor the, uh, the emission uh, and the absorption of your material by designing the arrangement of your plasmonic nanostructure, you can really achieve a material which can eat up a lot but doesn't lose this uh, temperature or heat by radiation. Yes. Yeah, I'm not sure I understand how this works because no. having a 100% absorption, as you said, you can have with carbon. While the game you are playing with the thermoplasmonics, uh, the isolated objects. Yes, it converts in heat that requires not having a hundred percent absorption, but having a high cross section for absorption. Is not sure there. You, I don't know if how they yes. combine. This happen a specific wavelength. So it's a real bit. Yes, this is kind of strange. Yes, probably this is some kind of final application, uh, which uh, not does not, uh, as you said catch all the uh, real uh, uh, advantages of using thermoplasmonics, which is indeed having a strong gradient of temperature. So they, they have localized. some temperature, they really got some high temperature with this metal? With this metal, not yeah. really high temperature. Okay, so that's, they, they get that's a proof. Yeah, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. indeed, they get just evaporation of water. And oh, I would say all these uh, example that I'm sh I will show here, um, about the evaporation of water is more like this, because it's not really um, uh, they are not really exploiting what is the central point probably of uh, thermoplasmonic which can be more interesting other technological application like uh, particle trapping or heat mag magnetic assisted recording or uh, solar thermo form form photovoltaics for example to, to really achieve very strong high temperature mm -hmm. uh, but um, yes sorry no no thank you thank you this uh, and okay, this is uh, general. Uh, that's the explosion of this. Uh, um, uh, this is just to see uh, what we should consider. For example, wh when we design some solar absorber, which can generate steam. So all the losses uh, m that are involved in your system uh, uh, about the convection, uh, uh, the conduction, of course, and the radiation, as I said before, uh, and how you can um, compute the, the, of course, the efficiency of solar evaporation. Uh, and uh, so this is some uh, uh, interesting, uh, um, let's say this, this, this field should be mo much more developed uh, in, the, in, in the future years because uh, to really be the, 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 uh, the established technology for, uh, for example, desalinization, so we are really far away uh, from, from that. This is some examples, again, uh, about steam generation. Uh, and uh, here there was uh, probably one of the first uh, examples where they put the golden ore particles inside the, uh, in the solution and they shine the light and they start to saw uh, this uh, evaporation of the water. And uh, this is also a famous example about this uh, and that also start to, uh, to maybe give also more insight why it could be interesting to use these particles, for example. Uh, they, this, uh, in this example, for example, they demonstrate also the possibility to use this evaporation uh, to separate different chemicals. Uh, so mixture of chemicals like ethanol water, methanol water, so normal distillation processes. And uh, what they found was that the, um, the, uh, the <coughs> let's say, composition of the vapor uh, was, uh, was much more rich in ethanol in comparison with thermal processes. So this probably tells that uh, the uh, heating at the surface of the particles creates some uh, really peculiar condition to, uh, to, to drive uh, um, out of equilibrium uh, processes and, uh, and so create different, uh, different let's say, um, for example, evaporation or distillation processes or equilibrium which are not possible to generate in normal thermal conditions. So maybe you can create some mixture uh, which are more, tr more rich in specific chemicals, so you, you change uh, the composition of uh, of the objective that can be uh, distillated, basically. And um, this is another uh, example, again, uh, about the solar evaporation. So as you can see, you can really create many different materials uh, using nanowires, 
and particles which you can deposit uh, uh, inside the structure. This was uh, again a famous example where they uh, really got a lot of attention. Basically, uh, they use this membrane which were able to float naturally on the water. So this, of course, is interesting. And they put inside aluminum particles uh, uh, and showing really high uh, efficiency in solar evaporation, solar desalinization. And uh, this kind of, uh, of device, of course, is very interesting because uh, if you, uh, the membrane are very cheap, for example, aluminum, then you can put al aluminum nanoparticles, so the cost of all the devices is, very, uh, is quite uh, low, and so you can create maybe one m square meter of device, and that can be used in uh, some region where uh, you don't have fresh water, uh, or <coughs> and so you can separate, for example, dirty or contaminated water uh, and uh, then through condensation you can have your fresh water to drink or to do some uh, specific uh, uh, end user uh, application. This is again another example and this is uh, interesting I just want to report because maybe you make the point of also the Professor Paolo is like uh, <laughs> this uh, uh, using uh, many different materials and uh, many different particles but uh, really not uh, uh, introducing new uh, concept in this case uh, for example they, they was uh, nice because they use boots and uh, the, uh, the pores inside the boots to, and put uh, plasmonic particles inside the, uh, these pores of the boots and again this uh, was able to float and evaporate very freely into the water so uh, I think the, the point of all this um, uh, all, 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 all this literature is that really we can use resonant nanostructure in many different ways and also with cheap materials uh, to, uh, to drive uh, many different processes that, that can be useful so really this anybody uh, can uh, invent some kind of material which can be efficient that can be used uh, for the centralized uh, production of energy or production of chemicals uh, not only so in the uh, by uh, acquiring uh, acquiring very costly uh, apparatus and um, so the so now uh, after this uh, overview of the solar evaporation I want to switch to high temperature um, to the high temperature regime and um, so uh, for uh, this is important to uh, to say that the optical properties of the material usually change at high temperature so the uh, materials that uh, for example uh, they uh, show a specific uh, epsilon prime so the uh, relative part of the permittivity uh, if you start to heating up they will lose this um, this uh, metallicity so they will become less plasmonic which means they will uh, uh, generate much less intense electric fields uh, on your nanostructure uh, and uh, on the same uh, on the same way uh, the optical lo lo losses will usually change so uh, you uh, will have much more um, losses due to uh, mostly electro uh, electron-phonal <laughs> interaction uh, and so uh, you will start to have much more um, m uh, higher epsilon double price of the imaginary part of the permitting and uh, the first uh, these are really interesting consideration if you want to design specific material uh, or device for, technolo for technology that operates at temperature above let's say 300 400 500 degrees C uh, indeed, uh, as we can see here, ah, it works. This, but not on. The okay, not on. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, indeed, so if you, for example, uh, in this example, is very interesting to me because what they did was a simple experiment. They have a, li a lipsometer and they measure the uh, uh, epsilon prime double prime uh, of. Uh, uh, they retrieve the epsilon prime double prime for the li lipsometry measurement, and then they compute the uh, quality factors for. Uh, localized surface plasma resonant or also propagating plasma and what was interesting uh, was that at very high temperature the um, quality factor of the uh, metals like uh, the noble metal like gold and silver really deteriorated and uh, the um, the uh, uh, this uh, optical this quality factor of other ma materials like metal nitrides instead remained very similar to the uh, to the um, uh, quality factor of the noble metals so really, uh, this is important because, uh, of course, if you design a specific uh, uh, device which should resonate as, as a specific wavelength, 
uh, using the optical properties taken, for example, at room temperature, then uh, you will find uh, and you, uh, you want to design uh, you want to design a device which works at 500 degrees C. Then maybe you start to uh, try to demonstrate your operational device, and this will not work because this, your material will not more anymore resonate at uh, at, uh, at those wavelengths. So this is, <coughs> this is very important uh, to uh, compute. Uh, the optical properties of the materials at high temperature. Uh, this is, uh, I think, crucial to uh, the de development of these fields of high temperature uh, and extreme temperature um, applications. So this is, uh, again, uh, as you can uh, see uh, the, uh, the example of what's happening at high temperature. For example, you can see that uh, uh, also the uh, resonant field enhancement uh, really change uh, if we consider at a uh, room temperature or uh, at uh, 300 or 600 degrees C. And also it's interesting to see that uh, polycrystalline metals uh, films behave different than single crystal. Usually single crystal uh, have much more resistance to, uh, to uh, so the optical properties of single um, metallic single crystal have much higher resistance uh, to, the, to the temperature. And uh, uh, here uh, again an example. So here was the electric field enhancement with how it changed in the in the temperature. And here you can see uh, in, instead of the quality of your uh, localized surface plasma resonance how change in temperature. You can see that the intensity of the uh, of the um, plasmonic resonance uh, decrease uh, uh, when the material is up, is uh, subjected to thermal cycle at high temperature. And uh, this, uh, so the, all this um, uh, fundamental uh, study, uh, let's introduce the, the field which I like uh, very much, which is the, 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 the possibility to use these uh, plasmonic materials in uh, extreme temperature regime, which, uh, for, for example, solar thermal photovoltaics. So uh, just a few words uh, about the, uh, what is solar <coughs> thermal photovoltaics. Uh, maybe no, uh, not, uh, not all of you are uh, familiar with this. So as you know, the, um, the, the limit of efficiency of a single junction solar cell is uh, uh, the short Kazar limit, so around 33%. Uh, uh, th uh, and uh, uh, this is basically mostly due to the fact that when you shine solar light, so broadband light, into the semiconductor, uh, so the photon with lower energy or higher energy will not be uh, participating to the excitation of uh, electron holes and the generation of the photocurrent. Uh, this is just simply uh, say. Uh, so uh, there was an idea, like in the 60s, uh, so to use then um, thermo uh, uh, thermophotovoltaics. So they introduced thermophotovoltaics, so heated materials, uh, and uh, use the emitted radiation uh, uh, to excite the solar cell. Uh, and uh, in this way, so the, the theoretical limit efficiency uh, was uh, more shifted to a, like a Carnot limit, uh, uh, close to 85% of efficiency of the, of the devices. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the main idea of solar thermophotovoltaics is therefore to have uh, uh, some broadband absorbers which, which can absorb all the light from the sun and then it's up a lot, uh, reaching very high temperature. Then this temperature is, uh, is um, basically uh, transmitted to the emitter and th then the emitter uh, emits uh, this energy uh, in the form of radiation to excite the solar cell. Uh, and of course this would be a selective emitter, so uh, this is the really the difference. So you have to have a s an emitter, so a nanophotonic structure that, sel that emit your uh, radiated energy just in a very narrow uh, in a very narrow uh, wavelength range, which correspond uh, with the uh, with the uh, wavelength range of operation of your solar cell. So, depending on your material, uh, like silicon solar cell, uh, <coughs> etc. So, you will have the different uh, you will have different wavelength range that you have to excite. And uh, so, uh, this is okay. The main idea, uh, as I said. So, this um, the main problem. Uh, I would say. Uh, in the past was that there was not an knowledge of uh, uh, how to design selective emitter uh, or absorber and therefore with the nanophotonics, so the plasmonics and also the electric uh, resonators, this, uh, this field really moved up uh, to achieve interesting efficiency. Uh, here are some examples, for example, uh, with, mm, uh, of devices which, are, which has been uh, yeah, realized by using, for example, photonic crystals uh, with uh, uh, actually 
um, refractory materials, so tungsten uh, or um, uh, covered with aluminium oxide to be protected, uh, or uh, other device which use, for example, carbon nanotubes, uh, as this one achieving 3.2 percent of efficiency. Uh, and, and so on and so forth. And now, uh, really, this field is moving up uh, thanks to nanophotonic and, uh, and um, plasmonic materials because uh, the, the point is really in this case uh, is to uh, design selective uh, emitter which can be uh, uh, which uh, which can have uh, the um, basically rad uh, emit radiative radiatively uh, the, uh, the the energy uh, in the background, for example, uh, of your uh, solar cell. And uh, in this particular example I show, which I already show during my lecture, is the possibility to use uh, a plasmonic absorber or, em or emitter in this kind of devices. Uh, and uh, how this, uh, this, uh, mm, in this uh, doing this, you can really use metal nitrides, which are very much resistant to temperature, so they are refractory, uh, instead of uh, normal materials like uh, normal plasmonic material like gold. You can see that by heating, uh, at up to 800 degrees C, you really uh, destroy the, uh, the the heat which is generated at the nanoscale, really, uh, no, in this case not the nanoscale, sorry, uh, which is generated in the structure, really change the shape of your uh, antenna, uh, while otherwise with uh, uh, with metal nitrides you can uh, retain the structure and therefore you can retain your selective uh, emitters or absorbers uh, in the device. And I think this is uh, the last example, so uh, it was very rapid uh, uh, of my uh, of the of this of this lecture. And uh, it's the possibility, for example, another characteristic of uh, which I found very interesting of thermoplasmonic nanostructure is the possibility to have really um, very high gradient uh, of temperature and heating up very very much uh, instantaneously your nanostructures. Uh, and uh, in this particular example, for example, uh, the, uh, there was a reported the publication of uh, aluminum nanodisc so, uh, sustaining surface plasma resonances uh, and uh, uh, they um, induce the ignition so it's basically the explosion of this structure by uh, the excitation of surface plasma and um, so aluminum uh, nanoparticles and aluminum nanomaterials in general are very interesting and uh, they are used for example as a propellant or uh, explosive uh, and this is why, basically, when you induce a very rapid oxidation, you can uh, you can induce the ignition of this structure. Otherwise, if the uh, if the rate of heating is very small, uh, you will have just the oxidation. So oxygen will just go through the nanostructure. You will we will form aluminum oxide. And so, uh, uh, in this case, they create really a high, high highly intense uh, gradient of temperature by using this uh, um, aluminum resonator, just one uh, one uh, layer of aluminum resonator, creating mm, several hundreds of Kelvin per uh, um, per second of uh, uh, gradient of temperature, and so creating really the explosion of this nanostructure. So the, this is just to give a glimpse that. Uh, by designing these uh, arrays of resonator, we can really do many different things, uh, many different things. And so this, is, I think, it was uh, the last slide. And uh, so uh, what I would like to uh, just to summarize uh, uh, from this lecture is really that we can use plasmonic nanostructure to deliver the local scale very intense, uh, a very intense thermal gradient that can be used. Uh, to drive processes which are maybe uh, would not be able to drive in a different way, uh, and uh, of course this can be used also to to, to heat up uh, microscopic devices and so really substitute on the other end uh, a normal processes which are uh, driven thermally, uh, like uh, evaporation for example. Uh, and um, another point, of course, to use uh, this uh, plasmonic nanostructure is that we could use very much less energy than comparable. Uh, with uh, with microscopic uh, um, processes, and so we can really mitigate the, the, the amount of energy that we put uh, that we put in the heating and cooling nowadays. And uh, so finally, uh, I think the uh, there is really the uh, possibility to study how to use this material for extreme temperature uh, regime for solar thermovoltaics, meaning uh, inducing uh, thousand of degree or. Uh, even uh, hundreds of degrees, so for example, to develop a technology which can be used, for example, for solar uh, cell, 
uh, or for uh, even uh, um, information technology to uh, by just uh, inducing um, a magnetic storage of uh, of uh, uh, data. So this is was uh, uh, the lecture. So thank you very much for everybody. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, Alberto. so we have time for only questions. <laughs> uh, um, you did not mention, or maybe I missed it, um, if you work with uh, pulsed light irradiation. Because we, we looked a little bit into this field and our laser collaborator then he told us and if you come with femtosecond you have nearly no heat and if you come with actually nanosecond you have a lot of heat and we did some cell experiments and so and so there was a, yeah. uh, as far as I know uh, uh, actually if you use like continue, uh, if you use femtosecond, uh, femtosecond laser you, you deliver much more energy than continuous wave illumination so we'll have much more out of equilibrium condition and much more heating locally so uh, as far as uh, there's people that have looked into that also, like I did, I can show ah. some results. Yeah, but this guy so he did also some work then, and he said something like that you have a lot of energy, but uh, I don't know how it dissipated. And before the next pulse was coming, that the energy the, no, the it's environment what to say, was not If you really want to can. warm up or heat up the whole thing, yeah, it, it doesn't work because yeah. you heat up instantaneously the system yeah. and you can get 2000 degrees instantaneously <coughs> but then you start uh, getting to the other time scale where the heat is being transferred through the, through the, the substrate you have what is called the individual heating which is happening in the picosecond time scale <coughs> and the collective heating so everything became, becomes like a hot plate mm. depending on the density which is on the uh, microseconds because the, the thermal diffusion. So the person you are referring to is thinking of heating everything. <coughs> so if you tip a, a, a femtosecond laser pulsed, which has even 80 megahertz repetition rate, in between one pulse and the other one, too much time has gone by and the system heat up and goes down, you don't get an increase of the substance. So that's the story. Okay. So there are different time scales that come into play. Thank you. More questions? Uh, for example, like catalysis. Mm. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. How is that, like, risk of uh, fleeing to the media, uh, nanomaterials and nanostructure? How is that assessed in this kind of... The catalysis uh, is not really assessed. Like, indeed, there's the heterogeneous catalysis guy are very sex skeptical about the use of plasmonic materials into catalytic system, really, because the problem of heating is not really well addressed. Uh, and uh, so how this will change the catalyst, how will induce the leaching of the catalyst, and, uh, and so on and so forth. So this is a really important point, and that's why titanium is better than gold and silver. <laughs> <laughs> so no, anyhow, uh, it's really important. So again, the stability of your catalyst uh, should be assessed when you do the reaction, for example. When you, for example, when we do photocatalysis also with plasmas, uh, we do so-called uh, uh, recyclability test. So we, we use uh, ten, 10 times, for example, the catalyst in the same condition, and we see if there is a degradation of the activity uh, even after the 10, the 10 cycles, for example. And, and comparatively, is it higher or lower? The uh, usually, so usually it can, higher is, it depends. It depends on by the materials. So if you have a, some process which induce activation or change of materials, maybe it can be activated and increased, but usually it degrees the activity of the catalyst. Mm -hmm. So, or, or it stays the, the same. So, hopefully. Okay. More questions? Marcus? In terms of efficiency for these. Uh, 
what the salination scheme by steam generation do you know how how far is it for conventional methods I don't know which one are those but uh, I, I wanted to know if it's efficient enough to be subjected to some kind of Mm, yeah, some, some sort of machine or some real actual application in, in the future. Uh, I think actually this guy which invented uh, invented this combination of materials like with the member and floating, they patent this and they are sell, trying to sell in China. This is a Chinese guy and they are trying to sell this kind of technology. So it's like, uh, uh, I don't know, not. I think normal technology for this simulation is no uh, inverse bosons or something like that. Uh, so, but uh, there was also a big fight about this guy in the in the journals saying because they were claiming that plasmonic is very much more efficient to drive these macroscopic processes and so on and so forth. Uh, but so I think that they are trying to do this, and uh, I think I I'm doing something that's similar to that. So uh, I think for you know small scale application or really for family or for decentralized use of this it can be something that this uh, can be become real uh, especially if you produce some materials which is very cheap like I don't know five dollars per per square centimeter square meter or ten dollars per square meter and then you can really sell to anybody or in Africa or in underdeveloped country to be to produce uh, fresh water uh, so where there is no possibility to to I don't have investment of millions of dollars to, to purify water, for example. Okay. Yeah, oh, no, no. Please. <laughs> <Please. laughs> I, I saw a nice video on YouTube <laughs> where a guy put four sticks in the ground. It was a sand region, so he put a uh, membrane of a cellophane. Put some water, so he made a giant la lens. And then he put a pot, black, with water, and then yes. he, his lens was really focusing and boiling the water. And then <laughs> nanotechnology. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you can use salty, salty water for a lens <laughs> and get. <I> don't know. <laughs> it was nice to see. <laughs> I'm, plus, I'm pro plasmonic, so I should yeah. have a different. Exactly, yeah, let's get you know. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> but uh, it's true. Uh, but not all the people have like even basic knowledge about optics or how to con. Yeah, but you can send the kit, no? For sticks, mm. <laughs> cell phone. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Aluminum foil. If you, you have want to, to sell something <laughs> different, you have to sell something different. Yeah. Yeah. all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but soon something different will be selling something normal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 okay. Let's build an enterprise and try it. Yeah, we have three of us. Let's try to do <laughs> sell it. And, uh, three sticks and, uh, and the pot. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Any other questions, comments? <laughs> <No>? <laughs> okay, if not, so let's send the sticker again.